So now it's my privilege to introduce our first speaker of the evening, Guy Nordensen, Professor of Structural Engineering and Architecture at Princeton University's School of Architecture. Professor Nordensen has been a structural engineer for some very major projects, the Santa Fe Opera House, uh, the Jubilee Church at Ho and in Rome, and the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC, and this is just to name a few. He's also led a number of very high profile research projects on coastal resilience to hurricanes. In 2009, uh, Professor Nordenson was awarded the American Institute of Architects Collaborative Achievement Award, and the same year he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He served as commissioner of the New York City Public Design Commission and is a member of the New York City Panel on Climate Change. So his presentation is titled Climate Adaptation by Design. And uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Nordenson. Bonsoir. I am um, going to talk to you tonight about a variety of projects that we have been involved in over the last about 10, 12 years, which are efforts at combining the science of um, climate science and storm surge um, prediction with design and including landscape design. And our ambition is to bring together the communities of climate scientists and hurricane modelers with the design community so that both can help each other frame the important problems that they need to address. I'm going to show you seven different projects over the course of that period of time, and they're in chronological order, and they show you a kind of evolving methodology and process of uh, study and analysis, which we have tried to refine over this period of time. This is work that has gone on mostly at Princeton with colleagues uh, there, but also including the landscape architecture program at City College, led by my wife, Catherine Sievit. The first project that um, we started on in this area was a project which led to this book on the water Palisade Bay, which was prompted um, by, in a sense prompted actually by 9-11. And the realization after 9-11 that the region as a whole was really um, a, a, an aggregate that needed to be understood and considered uh, both including New York and New Jersey, and in particular focusing on the body of water that gathers that region together. We developed a series of projects around that body of water that were an effort to address the consequences of sea level rise and climate change, but also an effort to try to use that problem as a way of reconceptualizing our region. We identified what we call Palisade Bay, which unfortunately is a name that has not stuck yet, as the body of water between the Verrazano Bridge and Lower Manhattan, and tried to look at this as a public space, analogous to the way in which Central Park was identified at first as a piece of land within a larger void that eventually became seen as a very specific public space within the city. And so our ambition was to draw this figure of the water and see whether we could help people understand it as not just a problem, if you will, but an opportunity and a public space around which the region could gather. So we came up with all kinds of different ideas about how to populate the edge in order to make it ecologically more resilient, in order for islands and other features to try to dissipate the effect of wave energy in the event of a storm, but also use all those elements as a way of changing the character of both the edge, but also the water. 
Um, so some of this was whimsical, using subway cars, which we actually export to other um, coastal states where they're used as artificial reefs. So maybe keep those and use those ourselves and um, intervene in a number of different ways in this um, place. Again, for us, it wasn't just solving a problem of adaptation, but it was also seeing this in a long line of transformations that had occurred in New York, starting, of course, with Central Park, which was, as I said, drawn as a figure before there was a distinct difference as there is now between the city and the park, and has served since the Civil War as a very important public space for New York, not only as a piece of nature in the, in the city, but also as a social mixer, which is the way that, that um, Olmsted, the landscape architect, saw it. So we were applying some of the same ideas to, to our place. Now, moving into the scientific aspect of this, one of the things we also wanted to see conceptually was the continuum between the landscape underwater and the landscape on land. And to start to draw that as a continuum, combining the bathymetry, which is the underwater landscape, with the topography in what became known as topobathies. So looking at this landscape as a continuum, not seeing the water as an edge or a waterfront, but seeing it as a much more dynamic um, uh, region between wet and dry that was occupying a portion of this, of this territory. And then using those 3D models to start to do some fluid dynamic assessments of some of the interventions that we were talking about. So these are what are called ADCIRC models, um, very early primitive ones that we were using now about 12 years ago to look at what these kinds of interventions might do in dissipating wave energy and contributing in other ways. And then running simulations of hurricanes. Um, this was Hurricane Isabel, which we simply displaced and used as a simulation of a similar hurricane coming in and hitting New York and trying to see whether there was any impact. And those two figures show, not, show the fact that there is um, not so much a reduction in the water elevation, but there is a reduction in the intensity of the of the wave action and the water velocity affected by these intervention, which is, you know, you see the, the, the fuchsia line is, is lower. That's the surface wave velocity um, plotted um, once we put those islands in, in the space. Another thing that we did was to look at this, again, regionally and start to map the character of the waterfront all the way around. We were interested in looking at what was there and taking inspiration from the ruins and industrial archaeology and other features and using those as a prompt for design ideas. So the first step to that was this kind of uh, mapping which led to these atlases that we started to develop that again was trying to document this but also again identified as a new kind of place. So running through these um, uh, close-up looks at what was there. And, you know, you, you see immediately that, for one thing, no one had ever produced a map like this, and no one was actually planning for the comprehensive um, resilience of this, of this coastline. No one is actually thinking of how the water was going to move in and out and, and get around barriers that had built in certain particular locations. We also did studies that were more qualitative to try to see what fluid dynamic um, phenomena might do in terms of inspiring design. This was a team led by the Architecture Research Office in New York, Adam Urinsky, who started to play around with a water table that we borrowed from the University of Michigan to see what, what could inspire some of the design ideas that um, we were going to propose. And this was um, what resulted was a kind of gridded pattern out in the water that would serve as offshore islands and reefs and wetlands that could contribute not just to uh, dissipate the energy of a storm surge and the wave action, but could also start to replace some of the um, wetlands and other ecological uh, territory that was going to be submerged with sea level rise. So trying to um, have multiple functions with these. 
With that research in hand, um, I, I, over the course of about a year, pestered the Museum of Modern Art uh, with the idea of doing an exhibition based on this research. And Barry Bergdahl picked up the idea and turned it into a fascinating workshop, which Pippa was involved in, I think, with Kate Orff, where five teams of architects and landscape architects were selected to each take a particular portion of this um, Palisade Bay and focus in on and develop a design that would elaborate on some of these ideas and intervene both from a design standpoint but also from a science and engineering standpoint in these different regions, including Lower Manhattan, but also the Gowanus area number four, which Pippa's team was um, in charge of. This was all then exhibited. The important thing about doing it at the Museum of Modern Art, besides their great support and Barry's um, leadership, was that it was an unexpected location for an exhibition like this, and so it got a lot of attention, a lot of write-ups in the press, and a lot of interest on the part of the city that started to realize that this is a way of thinking about the interaction of landscape, engineering infrastructure, and public space that could start to inform their thinking. This was all happening under the Bloomberg administration, so there was also a, a receptivity to these, these ideas. Um, beyond that, we then did a project uh, together with the Louisiana State University for the Mississippi Delta. This was inspired, this project, by an idea that was percolating after Katrina in the Delta, uh, particularly advanced by Robert Twilley, who is a um, green scientist at LSU, that in order to rebuild the wetlands that were, as you know, sinking into the sea, um, it would be um, necessary to start to change the planning of the flow of the Mississippi. As you know, the Mississippi is very highly controlled and go goes through a path that's determined by the Army Corps of Engineers in the US, the result of which is, as you can see on the bottom right, all of the sediment that comes down the Mississippi gets dumped off the continental shelf and doesn't serve its, its historical purpose of rebuilding the delta. So what Twilly and others had suggested is there needs to be a series of diversions that start to take that sediment and redirect it into various lobes in the Mississippi Delta that help to replenish and rebuild the sinking um, wetlands. This is important for ecological reasons. It's important in terms, again, of storm surge protection, sea level rise, et cetera. So we took this idea and tried to represent it for an exhibition that had been organized at the Venice Biennale where we had been invited to show the um, New York project and felt that it was a good opportunity to collaborate also with LSU on showing their ideas for, for the Delta. So we identified these five, five um, sort of inspired by the Olympics and the Olympic colors here, five diversions that we would focus on, each one of which would be a series of channels and existing streams and bayous that would take water and sediment from the Mississippi under flood events and move those into different locations and start to rebuild the, um, the, the wetlands with that sediment. Do what the Mississippi had always done before it started to get controlled in the 19th century. We developed these diagrams, which turned out to be pretty controversial, where we were redesigning, if you will, the plumbing of the Mississippi. Um, this is a delicate question because lots of people are affected by the salinity of the water, by the land, by the flood events, and so lots of different opinions, lots of, of contentious issues about how this gets done, but important to get the conversation started with these somewhat provocative diagrams. In this case, if, if 2.4 million cubic feet per second of water is coming down, which is a flood stage, the Mississippi, where would you suggest putting that water through these diversions and using the sediment that comes down with a flood to rebuild the wetland in these different locations, as I had shown earlier. 
We then built these models, both of the New York project and the Mississippi um, project, which are exhibited in Venice in the BNL, highlighting in the model the continuity of the bathymetry and topography, this topobathy idea, and then also representing the water as a physical object levitated and floating above that land. The, the topography, the, bathymet the topobathy model is exaggerated in the vertical direction relative to the horizontal scale, so you really feel that, that topography. And then the water model is, is basically solidifying the, if you like, negative space of the water and showing it as an object levitated above that. Kind of an abstract representation, but one that drew in the audience and got them thinking about this idea of continuity and the water as a separate entity as well. This is the model being made um, before the BNL. This is then the, that, that was the model of New York. This is the model of the Mississippi with some of the detail as you can see. And so, you know, a, a beautiful object that drew in the audience and that's tried to get them in, in interested in inquiring about these, these ideas of diversion and adaptation and so on that we were promoting. In China, we did a brief project um, that was part of a conference like this that was organized there by uh, Princeton. And so we arrived with this um, very quick sketch idea for what could happen in the Pudong Peninsula there um, and how that could potentially adapt to the uh, typhoons in this case and, com and combination with sea level rise as well. Here we um, took inspiration from an old um, emperor, actually from a long, long time ago, who is still very famous for having directed the flood protection and water management of uh, particularly the Yangtze River through a means of controlled flooding. So very much the same kind of ideas that Bob Twilley is promoting for the Mississippi. What he did, um, what you the Great did, was build a whole series of channels and floodplains and allow the Yangtze River during flood stages to expand and extend into the floodplains in a controlled fashion and then drain back into the river. So it was a very sort of relaxed approach to flood management that he advocated and it really worked because people understood and were able to anticipate where the water was going to go instead of being always at risk not knowing um, whether they were going to get flooded or not. And that's why he is um, legitimately still very much revered today. So again, mapping the history uh, of, the, of that peninsula, trying to understand the topography and the bathymetry, um, building a topobathy model based on the information that we collected, and then developing a, an atlas for the edge. So the same kind of approach and methodology that we've been trying to develop over these projects to gain an understanding of what, um, what is there and what consistency or inconsistency there are along the edge and how that affects the interaction with, with flooding. The idea that we represented um, was of a series of open polders. And interesting, I was reading an article this morning on the way here in Science Magazine about a similar approach that has been adopted in Bangladesh um, for some time now, which I didn't know about. But here, uh, we tried to focus, um, inspired by a colleague at Princeton, Howard Stone, on the drainage side of the problem. What happens in a flood about getting the water back into the ocean or back into the river? And how do you control that in a way that not just the flooding is controlled, but the, if the ebbing, if you will, is also controlled. And so the idea here was these features in the landscape, basically mounds that would start to give landscape to this otherwise flat terrain, would create these open reservoirs that would catch some of the water in a, in a storm, contain it um, temporarily, and then allow it to gravity drain back into the ocean. So open polders, basically. Um, and the shape of these was inspired by chenier patterns that already exist, which 
which emerged kind of like dunes from the wave action and the deposition of shells um, along, that, along the edge of that peninsula. So there's kind of a break point in the middle of this story where Hurricane Sandy hit um, New York and a lot of the ideas that were presented in the, in the exhibition at MoMA uh, by, by Scape and, and many others all came back to the fore and all were very much um, on the table in the deliberations that then evolved um, post Sandy for the New York area and also for the region as a whole. Many of the ideas that we had been um, promoting got incorporated in various planning documents that were prepared in this case by the state of New York and in this case by the city. Um, this is an interesting document which actually happened just a little bit before Sandy or was in preparation before Sandy by the New York City Planning um, Department where they adopted this notion of the topobathy and represented it on the cover, seeing really the region in a completely different way, looking at that continuum of, of, of landscape above and below the water, and identifying, as Amanda Burden, the director of planning, um, described it, identifying the water as a sixth borough. Now, this is important because historically in New York, we've gone through this cycle where there was a time in the 60s and 70s where they were gonna build a new highway along the Hudson River called Westway. And there was massive opposition by environmentalists that stopped that. And as a result of that opposition and the buildup of constituencies around that Sierra Club and others, there was a very strong commitment for many years of not doing anything on or in the water. So the idea with these projects that it was beneficial to go into the water and to do something in the water was in a sense overcoming a taboo that had existed for quite a while, several decades. So the fact that the New York City Planning Department had sort of jumped over that taboo, if you will, and started to see the water as a burrow, as Amanda Burden described it, was a big change, consciousness change for the city. And I think that's an important aspect of all this, is how do you get to a point where there's a reframing of the way people see their environment that leads to a series of, of consequences. So uh, Mayor Bloomberg immediately put together a task force of hundreds of people that put a very uh, thorough report out that gave guidance to where the money that was eventually to flow in from the federal government would be spent to improve the resilience of New York. I recommend this document, you can get it online. It's quite comprehensive, quite beautiful, and quite thorough, and gave an outline of many, many different projects that would um, eventually be implemented, including down the light blue down there, project off Staten Island, which um, PIPA is working on now um, with funding from the federal government. Important aspect here is the fact that these are a lot of little projects. This is a thousand flowers bloom approach. This is not maybe a thousand flower Bloomberg approach. Um, not a single solution, not one giant barrier that will solve everything, but an approach that is much more decentralized. And that was a distinct philosophical choice made by both the, federal, uh, the state government, federal government, and the city. This was a competition uh, which was set up by the, um, the federal government through HUD, uh, led by Sean Donovan, the Secretary of Housing Urban Development, who's an architect trained at the Harvard GSD, and led to the selection of a number of projects, including this one along the waterfront um, and the project that SCAPE is doing that Pippa, I presume, will show you later. All projects developed through design teams co in combination with engineering teams and, and, and ecologists all working together generating these multi-dimensional resilience projects for uh, the New York City area funded by the federal government and selected through competition um, process. This is the SCAPE project, I believe, as it was presented for Rebuild by Design. About $800 million was allocated through a competitive process, through a structure not dissimilar to the MoMA exhibition setup, 
where teams were brought together, multidisciplinary teams, all of whom had strong community engagement. They were in competition, given a modest honorarium, given the amount of work that they put into it, but eventually won, quote unquote, projects that essentially meant that the communities that they had worked with got the funding for the federal government, which hopefully they would then spend on these, on these projects. So the idea that this is not just the federal government gives a check to a big engineering firm, but the federal government organizes a design process to arrive at these solutions is a big change in the procurement strategy. Parallel to the Rebuild by Design project, we did a, um, a study um, supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, which also supported Rebuild by Design, where we worked with four different universities trying to implement some of these ideas, bringing science together with design and developing a new approach to both the assessment of the hazard and the development of the response. We looked at um, Rhode Island, Jamaica Bay, New Jersey, and, um, and um, Norfolk, Virginia. Here again, we were focused on the topobathy, looking at our own new models of the geography of these locations, then um, using those topobathies to estimate the surge. A team at Princeton led by Michael Oppenheimer looked at the specific regional sea level rise estimates for each of the four locations. So we developed our independent estimates of the actual net sea level rise, including subsidence or rebound in the, in the ground level. Um, integrated that in with estimates of the hurricanes using global circulation models, in this case four, these four named here, which were used to generate synthetic hurricanes, thousands of tracks generated by Kerry Manuel at MIT and Ning Lin at Princeton, which is a different way of estimating the hazard, looking at a broader range of physics-based models of, <clears throat> of the um, of the effect of climate change. So the virtue of using the GCMs is you start with the same model for current climate conditions and future climate conditions, and you can then start to estimate the changes. So for Atlantic City, um, we started to use this modeling to try to understand what was going to happen, and then develop an adaptive design to that situation for a community behind Atlantic City that is at, it's very low lying, it was actually built on a wetland. Currently, it floods, and it flooded under Sandy. What we were then starting to propose are strategies that include offshore features that help dissipate wet energy, protection along the edge, and then planning inland for the likelihood that even with protection, some amount of flooding may occur in extreme events. So in this case, raising the streets, raising some of the houses, recapturing some of the abandoned uh, lots for for wetland and other features, and slowly transforming this into another kind of community with a more resilient system of, of resist, resistance and adaptation. In Jamaica Bay, um, Catherine Sievert at City College developed a series of strategies, including ways of enhancing the islands and wetlands um, and providing a series of protective measures, but also ways of improving the circulation of sediment in the back bay. And then what we would do with these designs is apply the uh, modeling that we had done to a series of scenarios in a matrix. And this is important because currently in the US we only look at one point in this, the 100 year return period under current conditions. And what we're advocating with our approach is to look at a series of time slices over a series of probabilities. So look at annual events, 100-year return periods, 500-year return periods, but also extreme events, and see how that changes over time, and then see how the implementation of the protection measures is able to adapt to that, and also how the gradual imp implementation of those measures will perform over the period of time it takes for it to be implemented. So this is a, what we call dynamic performance-based design. This is an approach to characterizing in a broader sense how these measures are, um, are helpful, both across several time slices in the same probability or one time slice in different probabilities. We also, um, we're publishing a book on this work that's coming out shortly. 
Um, and there's a website if you're interested in it, uh, Structures Close to Resilience. Um, .org, which has tons and tons of information, including a lot of the science-based work that went into this. Um, this is the second to last project, and I'll move through this quickly. Applying the same kind of methodology, last year we did a collaborative effort with the Regional Plan Association in New York, funded also by the Rockefeller Foundation, where we looked at ways of thinking through corridors in the region around New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. So how are these sort of broad scale features, uh, in one case the highlands, which is the ridge of, of mountains that runs across where the Appalachian Trail runs actually, um, and other, other geographic uh, features in our region. And then again, did a design competition with four different teams that were selected. Sean Donovan um, was the head of the jury, Karen Cito, who will be here tomorrow, was on the jury that made this selection. And each of these teams, again, worked through with the communities, similar to Rebuild by Design, the various approaches to resilience and adaptation for these different locations. We had an exhibit out in Jamaica Bay and another one at the Museum of Modern Art, PS1, showing this material. And then it's all gone into the uh, fourth regional plan, which is available online. And we're also working on a book to put all that material out into the public domain. Finally, um, we're currently working on a project in, again in Jamaica Bay. This one, part of a larger research effort funded by the National Science Foundation led by Ning Lin, so the same um, hurricane scientist who has been working with us since the very beginning, Michael Oppenheimer and she and I started working together on the very first project that I showed you when she was a student. This case, again, doing the same kind of modeling using GCMs to understand the change in the hazard over the changing climate, and now coming up with a strategy for a por portion of, of Jamaica Bay, which is right next to Kennedy Airport, which is up there behind the yellow line, producing a series of, of layers of protection that would be permeable under different conditions or could be shut under other conditions. So here, again, trying to think in terms of controlled flooding and a scenario-based approach where it's not just one barrier, but it's a series of barriers that perform different functions. So there's the purple line in the back delineates an area which could be flooded on, a, on the inside of that line, could be flooded on a regular basis due to rising um, spring tides, um, nuisance tides they call it sometimes. And then the yellow line, which goes from high ground to a ridge, high ground, that would be a continuous protection for the airport, but also for the communities behind the airport that could include some gates that could open and close over time. It's important with all these approaches, we think, that you consider the benefits of the improvement in the landscape, the islands, the wetlands that are out in the middle of the of back bay here, the value of the protective measures along the edge, but also second lines of defense and an understanding of what might happen when the line of defense that you've built is overtopped in an extreme event that you can't predict. One of the things that Dutch are starting to understand and, and to work through is the fact that you can't just build a barrier and believe that it will always keep the water out. It's not a dam. The water will sometimes exceed your expectations and come over the top. So how do you then design levees so that that can happen and they don't disintegrate? But also, interesting science problem, is how do you incorporate in your probabilistic assessment of the storm surge effects this weir effect? In Hurricane Sandy, it came in with a high tide. If you could calculate as it's coming in with a high tide that maybe a foot of water is going over the top of the barrier that you build, how much of that foot over the period of time that the tide is coming in and going out as the storm surge is coming in, how much of that is going to spread out and create how much water, say, for Kennedy Airport? So lots of interesting science problems, fluid dynamics problems start to emerge from these, um, these studies. I won't go into much more detail on this, but it's an example of where we're trying now to very specifically apply a strategy to a location near our home. Um, so any of you who are interested in this, 
I think I've run out of time. Um, I can explain it to you another time. But it's, it's this kind of layered protection, scenario-based um, protection that we're trying to develop and analyze with our, um, with our tools. So there you see a trajectory of how I think scientists working at the cutting edge, trying to understand the problem, trying to characterize it with um, benefit and use for others in other disciplines, can interact with designers in a way that both informs the research agenda and helps us develop design strategy as well as design specifically that are beneficial and resilient. Thank you very much.